I can't be slide one you take notes. No, 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 that's, that's <laughs> fine. Okay, great. Well, thank you. It's a privilege to talk to you all about the work I did around improving the reliability of mid-power helicopter duration models. The objective was to design, build, and fly a model capable of withstanding G-power boost. Um, clearly, Tuesday's event was a main impetus to this, but I really wanted this to be more than just about surviving there on 59. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what, no, sorry. What, so I, I, really, I wanted it to be more around what, what all could go wrong with these high, higher power models and, and all the different failure modes. So I want to identify the different failure modes and then what we can do to, to, to countermeasure things. So what I'll do is I'll talk briefly about my approach, a tool called an FMEA, uh, abbreviated uh, overview of the journey that I went through, a lot of trial, a lot of error, um, and, and a lot of learning. We'll talk a little bit about the deployment forces. John Buckley alluded to some of the challenges he had around that. I noticed that was a very big element. Some of my primary findings um, and, and my overall conclusions. And then we'll talk, uh, you know, open up for questions. So, my general approach was to brainstorm what all could go wrong. So you think of the different failure modes in a helicopter duration model. So I looked at and reviewed some of the past uh, data from some of the uh, local and regional events in the area. Uh, what helicopter duration events were flown, what models, how do they fail. And then I generated what's called an FMEA. It stands for Failure Mode and Effect Analysis. It's used in industry a lot in order to understand if your design is robust and how to, uh, how to countermeasure any potential concerns. Uh, assign severity and likelihood scores so that you focus on the most important things. And then develop countermeasures for these high scoring modes. And then I designed, built, and flew, and then repeat. Watch, rinse, repeat, and just go through it again and again until I got it to work. So here's a sample of the FMEA. And what this is, is a, a basically like what all could go wrong. And the biggest concerns I had in building this was shred on boost, separation at ejection, and, uh, and poor deployment. So what I did is you, you, you look at the different types of failure modes and you think, well, what would cause that? So separation injection, well, why would it separate injection? Well, one way was because the blades broke off, or another way might be because a hinge broke. Uh, why would it shed on boost? Maybe the blades got torn off, or your hinge broke, or your fins tore from the body. I was very concerned about the shed on boost, so what I did was I built a model with internal blades. And uh, that certainly, has, you know, there are multiple ways to approach the problem, but I, I basically used uh, the type of uh, helicopter design that Tim Van Milligan uh, posted in his report a few years ago. And, uh, and so uh, we'll talk more about that. But I, I wanted to go with a clean design and other advantages. It's, it's more likely to boost vertically. You have less things on the outside that can boost, that can change your, your, your boost path. So here's just an overview. Uh, you know, there's a lot of inexperience uh, kind of shining through in, in the earlier ones, and, and I started to learn more and more. My first couple of flights, really, I just I had way too small of a model and just boosted out of sight on an F engine. So forget about it, G. When I got to flights three and four, I needed, I, I recognized, hey, deployment force, this is becoming, this is interesting. By flight five, I really increased uh, my rubber band force, um, and, but then suddenly the blades were starting to come out, but now they're breaking off. By the time we got to flight seven, uh, I, I said, you know, it'd really be nice if I could calculate a way to understand how much blade force I really need. So I, I did a real kind of quick and dirty estimation, a calculation of that blade force deployment and what would be involved in that. And it was very eye-opening. And suddenly I realized, wait, I'm being very ambitious. Uh, what I did was I, I, I used basically a, a typical of the Bernoulli, you know, the Bernoulli pressure drag equation. And, I, and I, as, the, as you're opening up the blade, your area is increasing with the angle. And I just used a flat plate approximation for the coefficient of drag. And, um, and, and this opened my eyes. I said, wait, 15 pounds. Like the kind of model that I'm building, I mean, certainly you can build a, you know, like pipe flying I beams flying windmill. Like that would be able to withstand that kind of force. But this kind of model, I, I need to have something that's going to be more, more reliable, that's going to be, require more, less force. That force is required to, to deliver the blade deployment, but it's also extended to, to support, like all the structure has to withstand this kind of force. I was very worried about that. So when I did the design, it was a very non-scientific 
method, and it's basically, what can I fit? So that was my starting point. All right, let's put a little bit more rocket science into it. And, and I redid the calculation with the smaller 15 inch blade, and look how much the estimated force dropped into like 10% with the smaller blade. So you can see the difference in blade size. I mean, it's night and day. Now, my performance is gonna hinder, this isn't an optimization experiment, this is reliability. But I want something to be reasonably competitive. I didn't want to just make a turbo vortico. You know, I want something that's going to be, you're going to have to fight to, be, to beat it. But it's, it, this isn't, you know, this further work can be done to optimize that. But now suddenly I have a blade force that deploys with lower, a lower force, and with, with that is less force on the hub, the blade, the arms. How am I going to, how am I going to deploy that? I did some experiments with rubber bands. Number eight, number 16, and number 16 doubled. I uh, just did a simple experiment on how much I needed to stretch. And the critical area for my, for my model is here. This is where it's, it's going from this down to there. So I need this kind of force. How many of these bands do I need to generate the force? And so I came up with a five, and I, like, I threw an extra one in there just in case. My primary conclusions was I wanted the internal design to reduce the shred risk. Uh, the blade size, I need it to be very not, I need it to be, I need it to be a little bit less ambitious if I wanted to really go for reliability until I understood the optimization requirements. For mid-power models, um, don't be shy with size. <laughs> it's so funny, I, this is really big for me, I don't really build a lot of mid-power uh, mid <laughs> models. And I come, I come Tuesday and it's like, all right, it's not that big. But uh, we live and learn here. <laughs> but don't be shy with size. Um, so, so another big thing, I was very worried, and, and uh, Chris Flanagan in his uh, flop swing uh, glider uh, spoke about, there's a mechanical concern with the blade. I'm gonna, this is the arm, and this is the force pulling on the arm. You have what I call the top dead center effect, where so much of the force is like, going into the hinge. So what I did was, it's kind of quick and dirty, but I basically made three flex wing gliders, and I lashed them together, and I put them under the blade. I took it out just so I could show you. What this does, is it initiates that initial deployment. Mm -hmm. Just a, it's basically an, ex, an, you know, an external torsional spring that gets it going. And what that does is, once it gets started, now the rubber bands are in a much better, much better moment arm to get that moving. And another nice thing is it's underneath, so it gets out of the way and doesn't hit as it's going around. So I'll pass that around actually and take a look at it. It's a little bit uh, quick and during. I taped it together as I pulled it off, so. Um, it's not perfectly 120 degrees apart as I just kind of whipped it together after I pulled it off. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Here, Chris, come here. Let me let you. Let me get first dibs, exactly. Two minutes. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I had to, as I realized, bigger really mattered uh, from a standpoint of, of rubber bands. I need, I need to increase my rubber band uh, hook size <laughs> so I could get multiple, hook, multiple rubber bands on that. And material strength. Um, I, I armed for what I thought was fair anyway, and, and it worked. Um, what I originally started with was 330 seconds ply. Um, but here, what I did was I actually quadruple fiberglass this. I'll pass these around too if you want. Now we're done. Um, like that. But basically, what I have is full length fiberglass on the inside, and then two thirds, and then one third to really make it strong on the blades. Because I was having splitting problems, I was having fracture. Uh, and I just you can't afford to have the separation. Um, let, me, let me talk about this hub real quick and then I'll wrap up. So what I did with the hub is um, I put steel plates here so that when the arms come through, it doesn't destroy the hub. I've, I've captured the hinge with ply on top and bottom, um, 1 16th each side, so that not only is the plate stronger, but the hinge isn't going anywhere. And then the last little nice thing is I put some rods and some rails here along the arms so that the rubber bands don't get wedged into that arm when it's swinging. And I'll leave this up if people want to look at that. It might be easier than trying to pass this around. Okay. A few, there's a lot of opportunities to, to build this out. I mean, there's optimization, blade size, weight trimming, and there's a lot of opportunities to reduce the weight here. Um, shapes, material selections, and then alternate design types. I just went with this design type because I was comfortable. I, I figured I could get a nice straight boost. 
with minimal risk of shredding. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. So how did you do in the contest? I did get second place. Second place. Yeah. Can I run this just for a second, mm -hmm. Christine? Like, yeah. That's awesome, dude. We're still able to get the rubber band. You have to pull your legs or force on the rubber band just to get Can I just see the torsional spring real quick? Who has, whoever has it? A little springy thing. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, I'll show you. You said it doesn't get in the way, it doesn't fall down. It doesn't, no. It's actually, what I did, um, I guess I can rip this open. Does anyone have a knife handy or I'll just, I'll just show you? I'll just show you. So what I do is I, I literally just, one of my favorite modeling materials now is this alum, um, aluminized mylar. Tape. I literally just taped one rod there, and then I wrapped it around, right, like so, and then I ah. So you just taped it right to the rod. And I just taped it right to the rod. Thread through or anything. Yeah, no. Yeah, I just literally just taped it, mm -hmm. and just I, to kickstart it. Yeah, I guess get kickstarted. Exactly yeah. Right. yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> Simple. I, that was key because that's a really that's a very important aspect to reliability. is simplicity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful. So, after reading your report before Tuesday, my question about your, your failure mode effects analysis had been lost as a failure mode. Was that really a concern? But then after yesterday, trying to see the blasted thing, yeah, yeah. I see where it was. <laughs> um, so, so no, yeah, the rule book specifically says, you know, you want to get this up and keep it up as long as possible. But correctly speaking, it doesn't seen matter if possible. you don't see it. it yeah, right. So, so, so the, the follow-on question, um, and you may have already mentioned it. Uh, you, you'd, uh, you'd, you'd added uh, rubber band guards to the hub. Could, uh, but by accident or by design, could those could those be used? Could you use could those double as stiffeners for the hub? If you, if, if forces are enough where you where you risk fracturing the hub, could those could those actually have been? A it really does. It really does act as a stiffener because it is the weakest part of the hub. I didn't really, I didn't specify that point. But what it does is it adds an additional, it really 50% um, greater, I believe, the, EGs. Okay. The, the thickness right there where it's, where it's weakest. I could have made it even further stronger, but, well, it, it, it helped, helped. yeah. <coughs> yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Okay, questions in the audience? Good report, Alan. Um, so you made long and short plays. Do you have any parts to compare the performance of the long versus short? I, I did, and, and the, the summary is the long ones just failed. What happened is <laughs> he pounded the force. <laughs> so, what, so what happened is uh, no, it's, it's a great question. Um, what happened is that after my first several flights, every time I flew, I just felt I was just one failure mode away from from this, solving the problem, and then I solved the problem, and a new one emerged. And the last couple of times, I had what I, what I call the squid effect, and it would just land. Like this, and the blades all stuck together. What's going on? And 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 that's when I did that chart. I, I did that approximation, and, and I realized, really, like I'm getting too ambitious with that blade length. Mm -hmm. And so and so by making it smaller, I was able to get the blades out. And not only getting the blades out, I, I could keep it the plate thing from ripping itself apart. So would the, would the blades break in half, or would they come off the hinges? Uh, so the flight seven, which was my last fail flight. I had one arm came out and it split down the blade. One arm shattered completely off. And it actually held by the rubber bands. So as if I was like an impartial or so, I would have given it a qualified flight, but the performance was awful. And, uh, and then what happened? And the last one, um, the arm punctured through the hub and literally like went like, like that. <laughs> yeah. 15 pounds. So I got about three rotations on the way down. So those failures were at? Not, not hitting the ground. Yes, all the failures that I, actually every failure from flight three on was a deployment failure. Yeah. George? So do you attribute those to uh, the ejection forces or something else? I believe, that's a great question, George. I believe that the problem was that the drag force was too great. So I pull it out here, I didn't connect the rubber bands, but if I pull this out, my, it, it, one rubber band, see? So but if I had multiple rubber bands, this will come up nicely. 
but okay, but it's not coming out just me standing in a room. It's coming out with force. And what's happening is the wind stream going past these blades are just holding it fast. Yeah, I'm referring to the ones where you had the failure structural. Oh yeah, so when I increased the blade size, it was yeah, it was it was too it was just not enough meat in the hub. So that's why this most recent hub, this is the flight starting with flight eight, where I just beefed up the hub with the with the plates, steel plates on the top and bottom. And then I went with the ply, capturing the hinge with ply top and bottom around each side. So I have, you know, pieces. Sandwich. Yeah, sandwich. Exactly. Right. Can I have a idea where I I'm being told time's up, but I'm happy to talk with you more offline. Well, we have, it is now, we're having a short intermission. Awesome. Like about seven minutes. So you can talk to him during the intermission.